Thank you, Jordan, for leading us through that time of worship. And thank you, Terry, for those announcements. And thank you for joining here online for our worship experience. This morning, I want to share with you a message that God has been encouraging me over the past few weeks. With 2020 halfway done, and most of it gone unexpectedly than the way we had planned for it to go, I find that during these times, it can be easy for some of us, and maybe even all of us, to feel anxious. Before I get into our text for today, I want to share a story with you of when I was super anxious. I was in my final year of senior high. I remember it being towards the end of the school year and the third period on Thursdays was history class with Mr. Hobbs. And I remember one Thursday morning of when I found out that we were having a surprise test for our history class. Other students who had history class with Mr. Hobbs in the morning spread the news of this major test. Rumor had it that this test was one that would go towards affecting our final grade in a huge way, testing everything from the second semester. By lunchtime, my friends and I canceled plans to go to Tim's and pulled out our textbooks and whatever notes we had from the entire semester. Majority of what I could find in my history notebook was doodles of Batman, graffiti art, and conversations I had with my friend during class. I remember being super stressed and worried about failing this test. Even as I tell you this story, I can feel that tension. The bell rang, lunch was over, the time had come. I remember trying to figure out last minute plans of skipping Mr. Hobbs' dreadful test. But I realized that if I did, I would be waiting to get a better surprise at home. So I went on, sat down at my desk beside my friend. Both of us were just laughing our heads off, trying to shy away from our own worry for this test. Mr. Hobbs began to hand out two different tests so that we wouldn't cheat. As he finished handing them all out, he walked up to the front of the class and he said that there was a catch to this test. Not only would this test go to help our final grade before our final exam, but also the test was open book. (laughs) Oh, the joy that flooded my soul. My chains were gone, I was set free. All my worry for that test in that very moment vanished. I think the reason for that test, uh, for the test was that most of us who had Mr. Hobbs as our history teacher in grade 12 were probably failing his class already to begin with. If that's true, then thank you Mr. Hobbs for that major and dreadful test. We all have stories of when we were once anxious. Some are funny stories and some were probably really terrifying than others. And some of us are probably in a story like that right now. As each day goes by, I'm realizing that the different worries and cares of this world pile up one after another. Sometimes one stressful problem is solved with another stressful problem. We can't seem to just escape away from it all completely. Our Lord Jesus is no stranger to the temptation of worry. The writer of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. This same Jesus encourages us in Matthew 6, 25-34 on not to be anxious. This is the text that we will look at today. And so turn with me, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Matthew 6, 25 to 34, and here's what Jesus says. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, 
which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What's interesting about this passage is that Jesus clearly says three times to not be anxious about our life. That being said, there are two things to note about this pattern of writing in this text. One, that the main point is so obvious. Do not be anxious. And then the second one is that the main point, which is do not be anxious, must be taken seriously. Biblical scholars believe that when certain statements are written twice, directly one after another, or even in the same context again, it was a way of emphasizing to the reader to take what is being said seriously. And now, if that is true, we must take Jesus' words of not being anxious seriously today. In each of these times that Jesus says to not be anxious, he expands his main point with different contexts, giving us reasons on how to battle the things that worry us. And today, I just want to focus on four of them. The first reason he says for us to not be anxious, is that there is more to life. Jesus says this right after expanding on some of the things that we can tend to care too much and worry on, such as what we eat, drink, and put on our body. Why do we tend to get anxious about food and clothing? When I think about these simple things that Jesus calls out, they represent a deep need that we all to some degree concern ourselves with. When I think of not having food, I think of us starving. And when I think of not having clothes, I think of not being able to keep myself safe from the surrounding weather or climate. Combine these two together, having no food and clothing, we would lose having a long life. Now, if we don't have food or clothing to meet our basic need for survival, that is a problem that needs to be solved. But I don't think Jesus is talking to a group of people here who were utterly poor. Because if they were, I think Jesus would have fed them right away, performing a great miracle. He was talking, I think, to a group of people who were already having these needs met, but felt the pressure of anxiety due to their attachment to these things. For them, it may, have not, it may have been not necessarily starvation, but losing the opportunity to have a sense of pleasure, which in this case is eating. Some food tastes good, and it is a pleasure to have the ability to eat and taste it. When I think of not having any good clothes to wear, I think of us losing some human attention or praise and possibly an, an, an admiring glance that would make us feel good and validate us. And our cultural context can be similar to the audience of Jesus' day, possibly. And we can get anxious about these things. What will satisfy me? What will cover me? What will give me the attention I need? And these attachments are not just limited to food and clothing. For some of us, our anxieties are caused by an unhealthy attachment to some of our relationships, or our jobs, or our finances, in how many people like or dislike our social media posts. For some, we worry if we don't perform well and make the pursuit of perfection as a covering to some of our deeper insecurities. And here Jesus is calling it out, asking, is not life 
more than this? Is it not more than your attachments that is causing anxiety? Why do you worry yourself with these things? Jesus is saying that if you are gripped by anxiety over these things that somehow validate you, you have lost sight on the greatness of life. The human life is not for us to live in anxiety caused by unhealthy attachments. At the heart of the human experience, it is having an intimate relationship with God where the enjoyment, approval, and security in Him is worth more than anything else. Now, does that mean that God doesn't care about our satisfaction, our happiness, and our contentment? Absolutely not. Because going on into the next part of this passage, Jesus comforts His listeners by saying that we are to look at the birds who don't sow nor reap or gather into barns, but is still fed by our Heavenly Father. When he says this about his creation, he's showing that the birds are an example of being diligent and hardworking. They dig for worms and snatch their bugs and pad their nests with strings and leaves. They work with what is given to them. And Jesus says it is God that still feeds them. When we look at birds, they don't act like God is only a merciful provider for today but won't be for tomorrow. Hence the reason why they don't anxiously gather up. They go doing their work for the day, knowing that God who provides for today is going to still be the same God who provides for tomorrow. And the same God who feeds the birds is the same God who was with you yesterday, is with you today, and will be there for you tomorrow. Therefore, don't be anxious. The second reason for Jesus to tell us to not be anxious is that it is pointless. In verse 27, Jesus makes it clear that we can't even add a single hour to our lifespan. It really doesn't get you anywhere, and it does no good. Getting anxious over what is already causing us to be anxious is not going to lessen the anxiety it's going to only make things worse. But is that all there is to this rhetorical question Jesus is asking? Or is there more? I think there is more. Jesus continues after saying this statement, asking again about why we are being anxious about being clothed. But this time I wondered, what makes it different from the first time he called it out about what we are putting on our body? As he continues on, we see that he talks about the lilies growing and how they don't toil or spin, but they're still arrayed, which means that they are carefully arranged or fashioned in a certain way, making them appear beautiful and secure. And in addition to that, Jesus says that King Solomon, who had all the wealth and wisdom in the world for his time, could not be arrayed like that of any of the lilies of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow. And I think that's where the concern is for most of us at times. Whether we would like to admit it or not, deep down, we don't always think or live our life like that of the beautiful lilies of the field that are here one day and gone the next. In fact, we would probably like to live like King Solomon, with wisdom and wealth that would add more time to our lives. We work hard to take care of ourselves physically, mentally, financially, relationally, which we should keep doing. But deep down, for most of us, is the reason for our toil and spin to add a single hour to our life? Is that what we are stressed about at times? The scare of whether this would be our last day or not is not uncommon. 
And though we may not have the wisdom and wealth like King Solomon to take care of ourselves with security, we all to some degree can anxiously live like that. And here, Jesus says to us that just like God, who clothes the beautiful lilies of the field, who are here today and gone tomorrow, God, our Heavenly Father, who sees us with much more value, who knows that our lives are like the grass of the field, also delightfully adorns us with the right beauty and security from his infinite wisdom and knowledge, with our time being in his hands. And so, knowing this, this is what we should pray for. In Psalm 90 verse 12, here's what it says. It says, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. The third reason of why Jesus says to us to not be anxious is God knows exactly what we need asking the same questions that concern the listeners of his day and even our own, Jesus talks about how pursuing these things are what Gentiles, which in some translations, known as pagans, which would mean people who follow idols and false gods, would do. They are worldly people who have worldly attachments, who worry themselves with the things of this world and probably also toil and strive, thinking their life is in their own hands, and try to add another hour to their life. But Jesus comforts his listeners here today that God, our Heavenly Father, knows what we need exactly when we need it. The fourth and final reason of why Jesus says to us to not be anxious is that each day, has its own portion. In other words, God has appointed each day its own blessings and trials. As Deuteronomy 33, 25 says, As your days, so shall your strength be. We are reminded that God has given us the grace to enjoy the blessings and endure the trials that come our way in our day. And that can be hard at times. Sometimes we let our anxieties ruin the joy to celebrate the blessings in our day and wear out the strength to endure the trials of our day. But I firmly believe this, that by God's Spirit and by the encouragement of others, we can train our souls to not be anxious even when we face the trials of our day. Now, you might wonder, why did I skip the verse that is famously known? The reason why I saved this for last is because this is Jesus' clear instruction of how we can best deal with our worries. It is an instruction with a promise. As Jesus says in verse 33 of this passage, he says, But seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, And all these things will be added to you. When Jesus says this statement, he says it in contrast to what the Gentiles are seeking. And I like the word seek that is used here. It implies the meaning of strong search. And if we were to look at the heart behind a strong search, it would imply a focused attention about something or someone when we put that definition in the context of our worries and anxieties, it would mean that our worry, our anxiety, the dreadful fear, the overthinking, the overanalyzing, are symptoms of a high level of mental concentration on something or someone. And here's what I think Jesus is encouraging us with this verse today that instead of strongly focusing on the things that are concerning us, why don't we strongly, strongly focus on the kingdom of God, on God's purpose, 
and plan for our lives. And know that when we do, he will meet all of our concerning needs. In simpler words, what Jesus is saying is this. When we get our focus on God and his kingdom agenda, we can know for sure that God will carry and deal with our burdens. I love how in the New Living Translation, it translates 1 Peter 4, verse 2. Here's what it says. It says this, You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. Here's a question that I'm being challenged with these days that I want to challenge you with. Am I anxious about doing the will of God? When was the last time you and I had stressed out about God's agenda? When was the last time you and I worried and cried over what was on God's heart for our neighbors, our church family, our world? I'll tell you this. 2020 certainly isn't going the way I nor the world planned it to go so far. But the message that God spoke to us at the beginning of the year, which is to be a people after his own heart, that hasn't changed. In fact, during these times, it is being tested. And as we are coming to the end of six months of 2020, the question remains, have I been a person after God's own heart? My dear friends, we need to seek the kingdom of God. And the benefit of doing that is that when we grow more concerned about that, we can rest all our cares on him, knowing that he will perfect that which concerns us. That's how we cast our anxieties upon him who cares for us. We take his yoke, which is light, and we do his will, and focus on his purpose while he takes on our burdens on his shoulders. Earlier I had said that our Lord Jesus was no stranger to the temptation of worry. We see in Luke 22, verse 44, that Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane also went through the deep agony, and there he overcame by surrendering his own will and embracing his Father's will. When we look at the life of Jesus on earth, we see that his highest aim was to do the will of God the Father, which was to live a righteous, perfect, sinless life and be obedient to God even to the point of death. And by doing this completely perfect, he offers salvation to the world. And everyone who believes in him will be saved. Because our Savior sought to do the will of God above anything else, today we who believe in him live in God's great blessings as children of God. Jesus Christ concerned himself about reconciling us to God so that we would never have to be concerned about being separated from God. And he who took care of our eternal destiny is also faithful to take care of all our earthly worries. Therefore, we don't need to be anxious. Let's stay focused on seeking the kingdom of God and trust him to care for our burdens. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're on the throne. Father, we thank you that you are almighty. And we thank you that you have spoken to us through your son, Jesus Christ, of not to be anxious, of not to be worried. And Jesus, I pray that for each of us, 
who are watching this message online today, are listening to this message, Lord. God, you see all of our cares and you see all the things that are concerning us. Father, we place them in your hands and we trust your sovereign, mighty, good hand to work in those needs, in those concerns. God, I pray that we would not be wrapped up in our own little world, but God, that we would be wrapped up in your world, that we would be a people who would be after your own heart, who seek the kingdom of God, who are desiring strongly, who worry about doing the will of God for our lives. Lord, our lives are for you and for your glory. And so, Jesus, we surrender ourselves and we ask you that you would use our lives for your kingdom purpose, knowing with full confidence that you, who is our good and heavenly Father, will take care of all that concerns us. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we ask this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us here online today. We pray that you have a wonderful week, and may God bless you, and we will see you next week again. God bless you.